Hello and welcome to this podcast from Blackwell Online. My name is George Miller, and my guest today is physicist, cosmologist, and astrobiologist Paul Davis. Paul is the author of more than 20 books in the field of popular science, including The Mind of God and The Goldilocks Enigma, as well as having published an even greater number of significant research papers in his field. English by birth, he's taught in universities here and in Australia, and currently runs the Beyond Centre for Fundamental Concepts in Science at Arizona State University. In his most recent book, The Eerie Silence, he tackles one of the biggest unanswered questions in science, the answer to which has profound implications for all aspects of our culture and beliefs. Are we alone in the universe? And if Paul is understandably unable to give a conclusive answer, his exploration of the question opens up so many areas of inquiry, such as the origins of life on Earth and its future shape, that this is one of my top non-fiction recommendations of the year so far. When I met Paul during a visit to Bristol's Festival of Ideas recently, I began by asking him if he ever imagined what it would be like to receive confirmation of extraterrestrial intelligence. Oh, many times I thought uh, what it would be like to be present at what would have to be the most momentous event in human history. Uh, Of course, the chances of it actually happening, at least uh, on my watch, is pretty remote. Uh, I try to make a distinction between literally having contact with an extraterrestrial community, for example, by receiving a message which is uh, crafted for and directed at mankind, from simply coming across evidence that, after full deliberation, looks to be 99.9% certain that uh, there is some sort of alien technology out there in the universe. The latter is much more likely than the former. And, of course, if I were privy to that discovery, or even involved in it myself, I would be uh, incredibly pleased. It would be a crowning achievement of a lifetime devoted to science. But again, even that, even indirect evidence that we're not alone in the universe, is something of a long shot. But you say that earlier in your career, in your sort of younger days, you were almost convinced, I think was the way you put it, of the former kind of of contact, of the the, the sort of imminence or the, the, the potential of sort of close encounters but you, you kind of revised that opinion as you, as you grew older. Uh, yes, it's, uh, it's very clear, of course, uh, when uh, we think about the enormous distances between the stars, the chances of there being any alien civilization within, I would say, even a few hundred light years uh, are considered remote even by the most optimistic uh, SETI enthusiasts. So certainly in my teens, I was, of course, fascinated uh, by the idea of alien visitation, uh, read a lot of science fiction, which is uh, really uh, about that. And uh, it was only after I began to understand the real science involved that I saw that it was just, just not credible, uh, that there'd be no particular reason, even if it were possible, for alien beings to travel in the flesh around the galaxy, and there's no particular reason why they should do so, that uh, the idea that they should have come to Earth at this time, or even in the near past, just doesn't stack up. Earth is about four and a half billion years old. The galaxy is about 13 billion years old. There were stars and planets around long before the solar system even existed. And although there is a chance of alien visitation or some robotic system sent by an alien community passing through the solar system, even coming to Earth uh, at some stage in its history, because that history extends back billions of years, then uh, there's no reason why we should expect any visitation now. But we might look for evidence of some visitation, say, 100 million years ago or 2 billion years ago, something like that. Yeah, you mentioned SETI. Maybe you could explain what SETI is and why you think in its 50th anniversary year some kind of reappraisal is maybe timely. So SETI rolls off the tongue and it stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, It's a project that began 50 years ago this year when a young American astronomer by the name of Frank Drake first turned a radio telescope on the sky and tuned in uh, to see if he could pick up any messages from an alien civilization. And since then, a small but heroic band of astronomers has been sweeping the skies uh, in the hope of stumbling across a message from ET. It's a scenario, I think, uh, very much popularized by Carl Sagan, the charismatic uh, TV presenter, scientist, and 
author of the book Contacts, which became a Hollywood movie starring Jodie Foster. And that's many people's best understanding of what the SETI program is all about. Well, this is for real. People do use radio telescopes. They uh, appoint them at likely stars in our galactic neighbourhood. Uh, and so far, they've been greeted only by an eerie silence. So the question is, after 50 years, what do we conclude? Are we alone in the universe after all, or are we looking for the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time? So my conclusion is that, well, good luck to them. May they continue for another 50 years. But meanwhile, we should greatly expand the search. We should give up the idea of a message which is directed deliberately at mankind. I think that's not credible because the aliens don't know we're here. And the reason they don't know we're here is because if they are, for example, a thousand light years away, which is near even by SETI optimist standards, then they see Earth as it was a thousand years ago. You can't go faster than the light, so there's no way they could know that there is radio astronomy here on Earth at this time. So there's no particular reason they should be sending us messages until they're sure that we could receive them. They won't be sure until they get our first radio traffic, which will be in about another 900 years. So I don't think there's any point really in looking at messages deliberately beamed our way. What we could do is look for other things. We could look for radio beacons, which are not intended for anybody in particular, just for general galactic consumption. We uh, could direct radio telescopes towards the centre of the galaxy, where the oldest and maybe richest uh, of these communities may exist. They could have built beacons. The civilizations themselves may have long gone, but the beacons might still be going bleep after all this time. So that's one thing we could do. But the other thing is that we could just look for the most general signatures of intelligence imprinted in the astronomical environment. It may be feats of astro-engineering, it may be peculiar physical processes that we can't explain by natural means, maybe the absence of something uh, that should be there or the presence of something that shouldn't. And we mustn't neglect our own galactic backyard. It could be that uh, aliens or robots uh, from an alien community have passed through the solar system a long time ago and will have left something that is still traceable today. Mm.